Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to American Heritage. Today, we're going to talk about the 1920s and a little bit about Warren G. Harding and Calvin Coolidge and our attempt, uh, which was a relatively successful attempt to get back to what was called normalcy after the 30 years of progressivism and what had happened here. So just for the record, I am recording this on April 16th, Thursday of 2020, but I am recording this for the Friday, April 17th, 2020 class. All right, so here we are. As we've already talked about, progressivism had made serious changes to the United States and the progressives had been able to work those great changes and to reform much of America, not only in her character, but in her fundamental law. There had been a number of amendments passed that reflected the progressive desires and especially the understanding that the Constitution itself should not be some static thing based on natural law, but this ever moving target. And the progressive were quite successful. The end of the formal progressive era, the progressivism's never done. I mean, that, that's the nature of progress and the nature of those who support it through progressivism. That era is never done, but that time period from 1890 to 1920 really comes to a close when President Harding is elected president and he takes the presidency in 1921. And then when Calvin Coolidge becomes president, just a few years later after Harding dies in office, we really have these two presidents, Harding and Coolidge, who represent in most ways, not in all, but in most ways the antithesis of progressivism. And they really kind of come across to us more as 19th century presidents, not only in what they say, but in what they believe and the kinds of things they advocate as presidents. They really do feel much more like they come from the previous century than they do from this century. And they are, when compared with the other presidents of this century, they are truly the, the odd ducks in all of it. The 1920s was relatively peaceful. It was extremely prosperous. We tended to leave people alone at home and abroad. And we don't see that very often in the 20th century, with the exception, and not to the same degree as we saw with Coolidge and with Harding, but we do see a, a little bit of that in Presidents Eisenhower and Reagan. But otherwise, every president of the 20th century, left or right, doesn't matter if we're talking about Lyndon Johnson or Richard Nixon, they were all progressive uh, in one way or another. George Bush was as well. You know, interestingly enough, among the Democrats, probably Jimmy Carter was the least progressive, uh, but who knows what he would have done had he had a, a second term. But we can see that the 1920s prosperity was real. Coming out of World War I, and after the Americans came back from that war, our economy kicked it into absolutely high gear. For example, uh, just to give you a couple of numbers, in 1921, our national income was roughly $60 billion. But by 1929, just eight years later, it was $87.2 billion. So that's almost a 50% increase in personal income just over an eight-year period. Uh, and really, this was extremely noticeable in a lot of ways. I'll give you two examples. Number one, it was noticeable in how many people owned cars and how many people owned railroad, um, not railroads, sorry, radios. Uh, if we look at those who owned cars in 1914, there were about 1.2 million cars in 1914. But by 1929, there were 26.5 million. I mean, think about that jump. From 1914, 1.2 million cars owned in the United States to 15 years later, 26.5 million owned in the United States. That means that by 1929, one out of every five Americans owned his own car. That That's astounding when we think about that kind of production and what that took for 
not only Ford, but the other companies to be able to produce that and for there to be that kind of demand. And not just that kind of demand, but the ability to pay for that demand is really astonishing. But the other thing that we see, so if we want to measure it by number of cars, that's a good way to measure it. But the other thing we see is the measure of what we call leisure. And the idea that you would find all kinds of uh, of sporting events, football in particular, which means if you have time to go watch football, you have leisure time, right? And that leisure time was dramatic in the 1920s because there was so much being produced that people could actually take time off of work to enjoy things like football and other uh, sports, other kind of public events. There was even a moment which I guess probably in modern feminism we might not really like, but I think regardless of what our political views are, of it are, it tells us a lot. There was the development, the so-called development, of what were called blondies. Um, and I'm sure some of you have seen that comic strip that's not that great, frankly, uh, but that comic strip called Blondie, and then with the one with Dagwood who makes the huge sandwiches. But a Blondie did refer to the hair as women were peroxiding their hair, but it was a mark of middle-class status to be a Blondie because if you were a Blondie, it means that you could have your own business or domestic catering service, but you did it because you enjoyed it, not because you had to. The 1920s is really the first time in American history when women don't have to work, or at least we could say one of two spouses doesn't have to work, and typically it was the woman who didn't work. Uh, but that's really important financially and economically to be able to show that, that you have that kind of power and that ability. So Harding, when he becomes president, Harding, there's, there's not a lot that we would ever say about Harding that makes us just jump for joy and say, this is one of our great presidents in American history. And yet there are things he did that were absolutely brilliant. So uh, as soon as he became president, he let out of prison all of the peoples that Woodrow Wilson had illegally and unconstitutionally imprisoned as being traitors because they had opposed his efforts in World War I. Uh, uh, Wilson, as we've already talked about, was really just scum, not only in terms of his ideas, but especially in terms of his personality and his character. The man was, uh, I mean, he was a racist pig dog in every way, and he was brutal, and he was a tyrant. But Harding was none of those things. And Harding, as he said, wanted to make sure that everybody who'd been thrown in prison by Wilson could go home and enjoy dinner with their families. So he let everybody out. He also cut the budget by a full 40%, which Congress went along with. And he cut the military budget 69%. All of this is in his first year of the presidency in 1921. I mean, we can't even imagine a president coming in and cutting out 69% of the military budget and 40% of the budget overall. That's astounding. And, of course, Harding was able to get away with this, and it's part of what fueled that economic prosperity in the 1920s. There was even a sharp downturn in the economy right after Harding became president. And what we find somewhat famously is that this is the very last time in American history that the United States had entered into a deep downturn, either an extreme recession or a minor depression, in which Harding said as president, it is not my job or my duty or my right to interfere with this depression in any way, shape, or form, either to help it or to hinder it. That is the job of the people of the United States through their economic voting, that is how they spend their money or choose not to spend their money, and lo and behold, this became the shortest depression in American history. It lasted only a couple of months. So the very last time we did not intervene in the economy, it fixed itself pretty much immediately, even though it had been a very sharp downturn. That downturn turned into a great rallying cry for the economy throughout the 1920s, one that would last until the insecurities hit in October of 1929. We'll talk more about that on Monday. 
But let me read to you something that President Harding gave as a speech shortly before he died. He gave this speech on June 21st of 1923 to the International Rotarians. Rotary Club is a civic organization of self-help in which Various business leaders, business leaders from various different professions meet and they raise money to help their communities. It's a, the perfect example of an American voluntary association, the Rotary Club. And here's what Harding says. I, I love this. He says, if I could ever make another application for Rotarian membership and a special class cannot be found in which to place me, I am going to propose that they admit me as the chief consumer of films in the United States. Right? You had to have a certain profession. He wants to be the movie watcher. It is a joy to come and greet you. You are not precisely on my schedule, but let me say that if I I could plant the spirit of rotary in every community throughout the world, I would do so. And then I would guarantee the tranquility and the forward march of the world. Statesmen have their problems. Governments have theirs. But if we could spread the spirit of rotary, of self-help, of mutual aid, of association, if we could spread that spirit of rotary throughout the globe and turn to its practical applications, there would not be much wrong with the human procession and march of history. Now, that's fantastic, because at roughly the same time that Harding is saying that, we have Mussolini in Italy telling us that there can be no thing residing outside of the state, that the state is a machine and a person is a cog, the cog that makes the machine work, makes it work efficiently, and therefore allows for the true nation. Harding gives us exactly the opposite view of the fascists and of the Bolsheviks. And that is, it is only through true freedom that we find our ability to help one another. And it is only in that freely chosen ability to help one another that we see real progress. So Harding is the anti-Mussolini. He's the anti-Lenin of his day. And I love the way that he puts that. It's such a great way of thinking. So let's turn to his successor, to Calvin Coolidge. And I would ask that you turn, first of all, to what we finished with in our previous lecture. And that is, well, not finished, but came close to finishing. And that was Woodrow Wilson. And again, I want to look at his account for a reminder of progressivism. This is on page 624. And we can't imagine two more disparate people than Woodrow Wilson, very uptight, very racist, very bigoted, very anti-Semitic, all of the qualities that we hate about progressivism. They are all deeply embedded in this imperialist man. And then contrast him with the extremely humble, very gentle, very anti-totalitarian, not a racist bone in his body, Calvin Coolidge. Right? And uh, to think that they basically were ruling at roughly the same time in American and world history is astounding because of what different characters they are. But remember at the bottom of page 624 in your reader, Wilson says, the trouble with the theory is that government is not a machine, but a living thing. It falls not under the theory of the universe, but under the theory of organic life. It is accountable to Darwin, not Newton. It is modified by its environment, necessitated by its tasks, shaped to its functions by the sheer pressure of life. No living thing can have its organs offset against each other as checks and live. On the contrary, its life is dependent upon the quick cooperation, the ready response to the commands of instinct and intelligence, their amicable community of purpose. Government is not a body of blind forces. It is a body of men with highly differentiated functions, no doubt, in our modern day of specialization, with a common task and purpose. Their cooperation is indispensable, their welfare, warfare, fatal. There can be no successful government without the intimate, instinctive coordination of the organs of life and action. This is not a theory, but fact. 
and displays its force as fact, whatever theories may be thrown across its track. Living political constitutions must be Darwinian in structure and practice. Remember that never-ending, never-ending target, the ever-moving target of truth. Progress, progressive, all along the way there. Living political constitutions must be Darwinian in structure and in practice. Society is a living organism and must obey the laws of life, not of mechanics. It must develop. All that progressives ask or desire is permission in an era when develop, development, evolution is the scientific word, to interpret the constitution according to the Darwinian principle. All they ask is recognition of this fact, that a nation is a living thing and not a machine. Well, I'm still not clear who called this thing a machine. Certainly none of the founders talked about the Constitution as a machine. This seems to be, to me, to be nothing but a straw man in the way that Wilson is presenting this. But let's turn to Coolidge, because Coolidge is really the anti-progressive. He's an optimist. And he believes that there is progress, but that progress comes through deep moral foundations and through a deep and abiding piety towards one's ancestors. Only then can we move forward once we have a moral and ancestral root in the past. So look at these speeches that we have, and we've given you five different speeches from Calvin Coolidge. If we turn to page five, uh, 653, he gives a speech there, and that introduction, uh, undoubtedly written by Dr. Kaltoff, that introduction gives us a brilliant overview of Calvin Coolidge. and We find out really a lot about him, as Dr. Kaltoff writes. He was perhaps the last fully constitutional president. That is, he was scrupulous in his respect for limited government, the rule of law, separation of powers, and federalism. He presided over an administration that cut government spending, lowered taxes, reduced the size of the bureaucracy, and entered into no foreign wars. There was greater prosperity in America during his presidency than in any country in human history. That is true up until the 1980s. Calvin Coolidge was known for controlling his tongue. The newspapers often called him Silent Cow, but he believed that a president should be the nation's teacher. He carefully crafted speeches. He was the last president to write all of his own speeches. And he reflects a deep knowledge of the roots of the American heritage, and almost all of them encouraged his countrymen to hold fast to those roots. Those exerted here are concerned with voluntary associations, a free press, a free government, and local self-government. And I had asked you to read all five of these, and so I won't go over them in great detail, but let me point out a couple of things. This first one to the Boy Scouts. Very important Republican institution when it was founded. And what do we have with the Boy Scouts? He tells us, the Boy Scouts teach us three vital things, which are the qualities of good citizenship. The first is a reverence for nature. Right? It takes us back to Genesis 1, right? A reverence for nature. And the idea that man is to be not a domineering force over nature, but a steward over nature. Second, there must be a reverence for law. And as Coolidge goes on to say, when that law is created by all of the people coming together with citizens, little town meetings, and so forth, we must recognize that these boys will grow up to be the presidents of our railroads, presidents of our colleges, of our banks, owners of splendid farms, and of useful industries, members of representatives of our people in foreign lands. This is the heritage of the American boy. And third, there must be a reverence for God. It is hard to see how a great man can be an atheist. Without sustaining influence of faith in the divine power, we would have little faith in ourselves. We need to feel that behind us is intelligence and love. Doubters do not achieve. Skeptics do not contribute. contribute cynics do not create. Faith is the great motive power. And no man realizes his full possibilities unless he has the deep conviction that life is eternally important and that his work, well done, is a part 
of this unending plan. But then on the next page, on 655, we get an understanding of what liberty is as long as it is ordered and not anarchic liberty. Opening paragraph there, September 6th, 1924, the Constitution of the United States has for its sole purpose the protection of the freedom of the people. We must combat every attempt to break down or make it easy under the pretended guise of legal procedure to throw open the way to reaction or revolution. So don't allow for this in the Constitution. The Constitution is a set document. It's a document that we can understand differently at different periods of our understanding of American history. But it is one of those things that through teleology, we fulfill and make more perfect, but we do not radically alter. And think about how different that is from what Woodrow Wilson just said and what the progressive vision is. To adopt any other course is to put the Constitution in jeopardy, the sacred right to life, liberty, and property, and the pursuit of happiness. And then turn the page again, because one of the great concerns here in American history was what do we do with war-torn Europe? And that's in large part what, what Coolidge is addressing here. We can act best for Europe by being ourselves, minding our own business, and when we so feel like it, be charitable by providing aid to Europe, but aid not to remake Europe in our image, but to allow Europe to remake itself in its own image. The bottom of page 657. We cannot make over the people of Europe. Wilson had wanted to do that. Wilson's 13 points had greatly desired the complete remaking of Europe into our image. Coolidge says, we can't do that. That's not our place. We must help them as they are. And if we are to help them at all, I believe that we should help, not at the sacrifice of our independence, not for the support of imperialism, but to restore a great people, a peaceful civilization. In that course lies the best guarantee of freedom. It In that course lies the greatest honor which we can bestow upon the memory of Lafayette, who of course was the great Frenchman who helped us during the American Revolution. And then we get to a deeply moral speech on the following page, the press under a free government, which is about the press, but it's really about the accumulation of wealth and what wealth means to a free people. Very famously on line six, there on page 659, we have Calvin Coolidge say, after all, the chief business of the American people is business. Okay, that we can take for granted. That's what we do. We're great at forming businesses. We're great entrepreneurs. But how do we judge that? Look down to line 18. Wealth is the product of industry, ambition, character, and untiring effort. In all experience, the accumulation of wealth means the multiplication of schools, the increase of knowledge, the dissemination of intelligence, the encouragement of science, the broadening of outlook, the expansion of liberties, the widening of culture. Of course, the accumulation of wealth cannot be justified as the chief end of existence. But we are compelled to recognize it as a means to well-nigh every desirable achievement. So long as wealth is made the means and not the end, we need not greatly fear it. And there never was a time when wealth was so generally regarded as a means and so little regarded as an end as of today. So this is the great point. And of course, here we have Calvin Coolidge playing the Jeremiah. Be warned, right? Wealth is everywhere. We see it everywhere. And I will even admit as president of the United States that the chief business of the American people is business. But we must never take it for granted that our wealth is the result of our character. We have built wealth because we have done well in our character and we must recognize that. So turn to the last paragraph there on page 661. 
starting right at the top, the first full sentence. Important, however, as this factor is, it is not the main element which appeals to the American people. It is only those who do not understand our people who believe that our national life is entirely absorbed by material motives. We make no concealment of the fact that we want wealth, but there are many other things that we want very much more. We want peace and honor, and that charity which is so strong an element to all civilization. The chief ideal of the American people is idealism. I cannot repeat too often that America is a nation of idealists. That is the only motive to which they ever give any strong and lasting reaction. No newspaper can be successful, can be a success, which fails to appeal to that element of our national life. It is in this direction that the public press can lend its strongest support to government. I would not truly criticize the vast importance of the counting room, but my ultimate faith I would place in the high idealism and editorial room of the American newspaper, which of course molds and shapes opinions as a voluntary association and business. So we must have good news, good information, if we truly want to believe in a society that is not only virtuous, but growing in prosperity, dare I say, truly enjoying progress, real progress. And then we get to the fourth document, the reign of law. Again, along with all these other speeches, how do we understand our government and now counter this directly with what Woodrow Wilson said on 624 and 625? Look at that last full paragraph on page 664. Ours is a new land. It has had an almost unbelievable task to perform, and it has performed it well. We have been called to fit the institution of ancient civilization to the conditions of a new country, to fit ancient institutions of ancient civilization to a new country. Now, that makes sense. That seems to be the historical and proper view of who and what we are as Americans, an ancient people living on a new land. In that task, the leaders of the nation have been supported by a deep devotion to the essentials of freedom. At the bottom of the national character has been a strain of religious earnestness and moral determination, which has never failed to give color and quality to our institutions. Because our history shows us these things, we dare make honest appraisal of our shortcomings. We have not failed, we have succeeded because we have been privileged to rely upon generations of men and women ready to serve and sacrifice, and we have magnificently succeeded. Notice Coolidge's view. We can only be in the present moment if we honor the past. So it's not enough to just say we can start over or truth is a moving target. Truth is a developing target. It is not a moving target. And therefore, history is the revelation of truth, not the creation of truth. Those are radically different things. And then we get to this final speech, probably the best of, uh, not just one of the best speeches that Coolidge gave, but truly one of the great speeches given in American history. And that is, what is the inspiration of the Declaration of Independence? And look at the bottom of 669 here. When we come to examine the action of the Continental Congress in adopting the Declaration of Independence in the light of what was set out in the great document and in the light of succeeding events, we cannot escape the conclusion that it had a much broader and deeper significance than a mere secession of territory and establishment of a new nation. Events of that nature have been taking place since the dawn of history. One empire after another has arisen only to crumble away as its constituents, constituent parts separated from each other and set up independent governments of their own. Such actions long ago became commonplace. But somehow America has to be distinguished from that. That's true. We are a part of that. We are a part of that history. But there's something more to it than that. We weren't merely breaking away for the sake of breaking away. So jump down to the bottom of 670, that last non-full paragraph. 
It was the fact that our Declaration of Independence, containing these immortal truths, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, was the political action of a duly authorized and constituted representative public body in its sovereign capacity, supported by the field in general opinion and by the armies of Washington already there, which makes it most the most important civil document in the world. It was not only the principles declared, but the fact that therewith a new nation was born, which was to be founded upon those principles, and which from that time forth in its development has actually maintained those principles. That makes this pronouncement an incomparable event in the history of government. It was an assertion that a people had arisen determined to make every necessary sacrifice for the support of these truths and by their practical application bring the war of independence to a successful conclusion and adopt the Constitution of the United States with all that it meant to civilization. We turn the page again to 673. We could, as we see there on line 8, we could preach a radical equality because our equality believed in the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. We weren't trying to believe in some kind of crazy abstraction like Rousseau did in the French Revolution, or Rousseauian thought did in the French Revolution. Rather, we recognized the authority of God and the brotherhood of man. Jump down again, this time to line 24. In its main features, the Declaration of Independence is a great spiritual document. It is a declaration not of material, but of spiritual conceptions. Equality, liberty, popular sovereignty, the rights of man. These are not elements which we can see and touch. They are ideals. They have their source and their roots in the religious convictions. They belong to the unseen world, and unless the faith of the American people in these religious convictions is to endure, the principles of our declaration will perish. Right? What an important statement. We just saw in wealth that all of our wealth comes from our character. We now see in this piece on the inspiration of the Declaration that all of our understanding of the Declaration and all the moral support we can ever get it is rooted in our deepest religious longings. We cannot continue to enjoy the result if we neglect and abandon the cause. We are too prone to overlook another conclusion. Governments do not make ideals, but ideals make governments. This is both historically and logically true. Of course, the government can help to sustain ideals and can create institutions through which they can be better observed, but their source is their very nature. It is in the people. The people have to bear their own responsibilities. There is no method by which that burden can be shifted to the government. It is not the enactment, but the observance of laws that creates the character of a nation. And we should probably keep going on that paragraph, even though it's quite long. Because what does Coolidge continue to say? About the Declaration, there is a finality that is exceedingly restful. It is often asserted that the world has made a great deal of progress since 1776, but we have had new thoughts and new experiences which have given us a great advance over the people of that day, and that we may therefore well discard their conclusions as for something more modern. You can hear Woodrow Wilson in his criticism. But that reasoning cannot be applied to this great charter. If all men are created equal, that is final. If they are endowed with inalienable rights, that is final. If governments derive their just powers from the consent of the government, that is final. No advance, no progress can ever be made beyond these propositions. If anyone wishes to deny their truth or their soundness, the only direction in which we can proceed historically is not forward, but backward toward the time when there was no equality, no rights of the individual, and no rule of the people. Those who wish to proceed in that direction cannot claim, claim to progress. They are, in actuality, reactionary. Their ideals are modern, not modern, but ancient, those of the American Revolutionary Fathers. 
And then we get to the conclusion, but that was by far the most famous passage and most famous statement by Calvin Coolidge, that whole part, if all men are created equal, that is final, right? Then to the last paragraph. No other theory is adequate to explain or comprehend the Declaration of Independence. It is the product of the spiritual insight of the people. We live in an age of science and of abounding accumulation of material things. These things did not create our Declaration. Our Declaration created them. The things of the Spirit came first. Unless we cling to that, all our material prosperity, overwhelming though it may appear, will turn into a barren scepter in our grasp. If we are to maintain the great heritage which has been bequeathed to us, we must be like-minded as the fathers who created it. We must not sink into a pagan materialism. We must cultivate the reverence which they had for the things that are holy. We must follow the spiritual and moral leadership which they showed. We must keep replenished, that they may glow with a more compelling flame the altar fire fires before which they worshipped. So, in almost every way, Calvin Coolidge is the antithesis of the progressive in his thoughts, in his idea that we have piety towards our ancestors, towards the founders, towards our parents, in all of that, there is a, a really critical understanding that is much more of a 18th and 19th century understanding than it is a 20th century understanding. Unfortunately, in the way the presidency has gone since Coolidge, Coolidge clearly lost the argument and the progressives won. We have had all progressive presidents since Coolidge, with again the exceptions of Eisenhower and Reagan, and to a lesser degree, Carter. But I want to turn finally, in our, our last few minutes of class, we've got about 14, 13 minutes left, I'm not sure I'll take the whole time, but in our last few minutes of class, I want to look at Coolidge as a person. So even if you didn't agree with Calvin Coolidge and what he argued, I at least want you to know what kind of character this man was. After he left the presidency in early 1929, he was commissioned by, I believe, Harper's Magazine. I'm pretty sure it was Harper's. I could double check that. Or maybe it was Cosmopolitan. But he was issued, uh, asked by one of the great magazines of the time to serialize his autobiography. And so he does. He writes the autobiography of Calvin Coolidge. And if you ever get the chance, it's not a hard book to read. It is one of the most beautiful books I have ever read. And it certainly is one of the most powerful books ever written by an American. But in all of this, in his whole autobiography, it's fascinating. The autobiography as a whole uh, was just a mere seven chapters. But of those seven chapters, uh, he really only writes uh, two and a half chapters about the presidency, which is astounding in and of itself. And what he writes is pretty fascinating uh, because it is much more a criticism than anything else. He writes about, uh, in, at the beginning of chapter five, about what it was like to find out that he was president of the United States because Harding had died. He says, any reward that is worth having only comes to the industrious. The success which is made in my walk of life is measured almost exactly by the amount of hard work I put into it. It has undoubtedly been the lot of every native boy in the United States to be told that he will someday be president. Nearly every young man who happens to be elected to, as a member to his state legislature is pointed out by his friends, his local newspaper, and all of his supporters as being on the way to the White House. My own experience in this respect did not differ from that of others. But I never really took such, such suggestions seriously, as I was convinced in my own mind that I was not qualified to fill the office of president. I had not changed this opinion after the November elections of 1919 when I was chosen governor of Massachusetts for a second term by a majority which had only exceeded that in 1896. 
When I began to be seriously mentioned by some of my friends at the time as the Republican candidate for president, it became apparent that there were many others who shared the same opinion as to my fitness, which I had so long entertained. But the coming national convention, acting in accordance with an unchangeable determination, took my destiny into the hands of the people, and they nominated me vice president. Had I been chosen for the first place, I could have accepted it only with a great deal of trepidation. But when the events of August 1923 bestowed upon me the presidential office, I felt at once that power had been given to me to administer it. This was not any feeling of exclusiveness or pride. While I felt qualified to serve, I was also well aware that there were many others who were better qualified. It would be my province to get the benefit of their opinions and advice. It is a great advantage to a president and a major source of safety to the country for him to know that he is not a great man. When a man begins to feel that he is the only one who can lead in this republic, he is guilty of treason. Now, let me repeat that. It is a great advantage to a president and a major source of safety to the country for him to know he is not a great man. When a man begins to feel that he is the only one who can lead in this republic, he is guilty of treason. After President Harding was seriously stricken, although I noticed that some of the newspapers at once sent representatives to be near me at the home of my father in Plymouth, Vermont, the official reports which I received from his bedside soon became so reassuring that I believed all danger had passed. On the night of August 2nd, 1923, I was awakened by my father coming up the stairs and calling out my name. I noticed that his voice trembled. As the only times I had ever observed that before were when death had visited our family, I knew that something of the gravest nature had occurred. His emotion was partly due to the knowledge that a man whom he had met and liked was gone, and partly to the feeling that must possess all of our citizens when the life of their president is taken from them. But he must have been moved also by the thought of the many sacrifices he had made to me to place me where I was. The 25-mile drives in snowstorms and zero weather over the mountain roads to carry me to the Liberal Arts Academy. And all the tenderness and care he had lavished upon me in the 38 years since the death of my mother in the hope that I might somehow rise to a position of importance, which he now realized. He had been the first to address me as President of the United States. It was the culmination of the lifelong desire of a father for the success of his son. He placed in my hands an official report and told me that President Harding had just passed away. My wife and I at once dressed. Before leaving the room, I knelt down and with the same prayer with which I have always approached the altar of God, I asked God to bless the American people and give me the power to serve them well. My first thought was to express my sympathy for those who had been bereaved, and after that was done, to attempt to reassure the country with the knowledge that I proposed no sweeping displacement of the men then in office, and that there were to be no violent changes in the administration of affairs. As soon as I had dispatched a telegram to Mrs. Harding, I therefore issued a short public statement declaratory of my purpose. In the meantime, I had been examining the Constitution to determine what might be necessary for qualifying my taking the oath of office. It is not clear that any presidential oath is required beyond that which is taken by the vice president when he is sworn into office. It is the same form and oath as it is taken by the president. Having found this form in the uh, Constitution, I set it upon my typewriter, and the oath was administered by my father in his capacity as a notary public, an office he had held for a great many years. The oath was taken in what me, might be called the sitting room by the light of a kerosene lamp, which was the most modern form of lighting in the entire region. The Bible that had belonged to my mother lay on the table at my hand, 
it was not officially used as we didn't have that practice in Vermont or Massachusetts to use a Bible in connection with the administration of the oath. But Coolidge thought he needed it. Now, think about how different that is from our modern presidents a hundred years later, right? Not a great man. Never should think of himself as a great man. He takes the oath of office in the middle of a night by a kerosene lamp with a constitution draped over his newspaper and his dad holding the ability to create a notary, right? He is a notary. Having the ability to create that that made him good enough to give the oath of office. I mean, what, what an amazing man, men, what an amazing set of people. Mrs. Coolidge, Mr. Coolidge, Mr. Coolidge, right? Uh, just amazing. But then we get to the crux of it, and one of the hardest things I find reading anytime, anywhere, and that is what the presidency actually meant to Calvin Coolidge. My own participation was delayed by the death of my son, Calvin which occurred on the 7th of July. He was a boy of much promise, proficient in his studies with a scholarly mind, and he had just turned 16. He had a remarkable insight into things. The day I became president, he had just started working in a tobacco field. And when one of his fellow laborers laughed and said, if my father was president, I would never work in a tobacco field, my son Calvin replied, if my father were your father, you most certainly would. After he has gone, was gone, someone sent us a kind letter that he had written about the same time to a young man who had congratulated young Calvin on being the first boy, like first lady, right, but first boy, first son, of the land. To this, my son had replied that he had done absolutely nothing to earn it and therefore did not merit the title which should go to some boy who had actually distinguished himself through his own actions. We do not know what might have happened to him under other circumstances, but if I had not been president, he would not have raised a blister on his toe, which resulted in his blood poisoning when he was playing lawn tennis in the south grounds of the White House. In his suffering, my son Calvin was asking me to make him well. I could not. When he went, the power and the glory of the presidency went with him. The ways of providence are often beyond our understanding. It seemed to me that the world had need of the work that it was prob probable my son would do. I will never know why such a price was exacted for my occupying the White House. There's Coolidge. All the hope, all the joy, all of it went out in the presidency because his son died on the White House lawn and Coolidge always blamed himself. If he had not been so arrogant as to believe that he could become president of the United States, he would have not put his son in that position and his son would not have died. I mean, that, that is painful and yet it is so tragically beautiful, not the death, but the reaction to it, that it is very difficult not to look at someone like Calvin Coolidge, whether we agree with his politics or not, and say there was a great president. All right. Thanks, everybody. God bless. I will see you next week. Have a great weekend, everybody.